Hello, Tamara Brinkat here, the SSCA Invasive Species Program Coordinator. I am going to be talking about the uh, new Invasive Species Spotters Citizen Science Program. This program is still a pilot project, so we're continuing to recruit volunteers and uh, refine this project as well. There are some uh, focus species for the invasive species spotters, um, including starry stonewort and gypsy moth. Um, so some of you may be already participating in the gypsy moth monitoring program. Um, the starry stonewort is a, a new one that um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about today because it applies to the shore watch program. Um, we also still encourage the volunteers to report other invasive species. Um, so any that you find while you're doing other monitoring and um, you can include these in your reports. <clears throat> we also want to provide an invasive species training seminar at some point during the, the field season this year um, to, to our volunteers so that they can learn how to identify some of the common invasive species that they might see while they're monitoring. Um, for uh, the starry stonework monitoring, the participation in this is optional. So if you're participating in the shore watch program, you can choose to add on um, the starry stonework monitoring. And um, I'll explain a little bit more what that entails uh, shortly. And we do have limited equipment available for this. Um, so not everyone will be able to participate in it. Um, similar to uh, the shore watch program, the monitoring will be done um, from July to October. So one of the things you might be asking is what is starry stonewort and why is this uh, specific invasive species uh, so important for us to monitor? Um, so I'm going to start off by giving you kind of a little bit of background of, of where we've seen starry stonewort in the Severn Sound area. So we've previously detected it in um, shallow open water areas around uh, marinas, specifically in Penetang Harbor, um, Midland Bay, and the Honey Harbor area. Um, this this uh, species does spread quite quickly, so we ex expect that it's probably in some other areas as well, including possibly inland lakes. Um, we just haven't had the chance to um, detect it in certain areas. I also want to point out that its range is expanding with climate change, um, so this is also contributing to the spread of it. Um, unfortunately, starry stonewort has a lot of negative impacts to um, the environment and some of our recreational water activities. Um, it grows around three meters deep, um, so this is where you're going to see those dense mats, and um, it actually does not respond to herbicides. So it's not a plant, um, so it won't respond to um, herbicide that other aquatic plants will. Um, Starry stonewort, uh, those dense mats cause a loss of native plant and fish habitat. Um, it has the potential to overtake shorelines and can affect, uh, can affect your property values or some aesthetics. Um, and it also can prevent uh, the recreational use of water and, and limit the enjoyment of shorelines. So some of the activities that might be impacted by this are boating or fishing, um, paddling, um, use the use of your dock or even swimming. Um, as I said, the uh, starry stonewort spreads at quite an alarming rate through fragments. So um, that's why Asia mentioned about the importance of cleaning, draining, drying equipment and watercraft um, before leaving a water body, because it really helps to prevent um, in aggressive invasive species like this one. Um, another thing that I want to point out is there's been limited successful management of starry stonewort, especially in Ontario. So um, once it's detected, it's very difficult to get rid of. And um, the, it's really important that we prevent starry stonewort into entering some of our inland lakes. And then once it's detected, we response, re respond very quickly. So when you pick up starry stonewort, it somewhat resembles fishing line because it stays quite crunchy. Um, and uh, some people think it even looks grass-like 
or um, it resembles uh, spaghetti, so it's also been called the spaghetti weed. Um, it doesn't reproduce by seed in North America. It does elsewhere in the world. Um, however, the uh, this would need uh, this would require female algae, um, but we only have the male uh, algae in um, in North America. So in in this area, it can only be spread by ball bills, which I've I've pointed out on the screen, or um, by algae fragments. Um, the peak of its growing season is from late July to late September. So this is when you'll see those um, hill-like mounds under the surface of the water. The algae is anchored into the mud or sediment by these clear threads with small white star-shaped bulbils at the end. Um, so this is the reason that it's uh, named starry stonewort because of those star-shaped bulbils. And this um, portion of the algae is what kind of anchors it into the, the lake bed. So you can think of it somewhat like roots of a plant. This is what the algae would look like when it's laying flat on a surface. Um, so as you can see by the diagram there, there's kind of a main stem and then there's also these what they call nodes along the stem. So nodes are the location where um, four to six branchlets will extend out from the main stem and there will also be these um, orange bulbs at each one of those nodes. Um, so it grows anywhere from half a meter to 10 meters deep under the surface of the water, um, but those, um, those uh, kind of masses or those hill looking structures, those will be around uh, three meters deep uh, below the water. There is a native algae that looks quite similar to starry stonewort. Um, this is cara or musk grass. Um, the main distinguishing feature between uh, starry stonewort and cara is that cara has textured or rough stems. Um, it'll often have some sort of musky or garlicky smell, and cara is usually found at the bottom of the lake bed, whereas starry stonewort isn't necessarily a bottom dweller. It can be um, in that range of anywhere from half a meter to uh, 10 meters deep. Um, another thing you'll notice is um, when you go to remove cara from the water and you're holding it in your hand, cara will droop, um, whereas if you were to pull out starry stonewort, um, it would remain stiff and crunchy. So if you're trying to identify um, starry stonewort and you think you have it, but you see those differences, then um, maybe what you're holding is actually cara. All right, so now we're going to get into um, how to actually detect starry stonewort. So the way that um, we're going to be doing this is through aquatic plant rake tosses. Um, so I'll explain a little bit more about uh, what that involves and how to do that. So um, if you're already a Shore Watch uh, volunteer, you would be receiving um, a kit with equipment from Asia. So if you choose to participate in the um, invasive species spotter portion of um, the monitoring, then you would receive a few extra items in your kit. Um, so this would include a white bucket, um, an aquatic weed rake, which is a custom rake that's made out of two rake heads and a rope essentially attached. Um, this is something that you can actually make on your own. Um, so I will provide uh, further instructions um, after this seminar on how to do that. Um, another thing we'll be providing is ID cards to help you identify starry stonewort. Um, so if you think you see it, you, you should be able to identify it with those. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, some el electronic field sheets and electronic uh, data entry um, uh, sheets, which is uh, similar to what you've been doing with Asia. Um, so how is it going to be detected? Well, essentially we, um, expect kind of bi-weekly or weekly um, um, rake tosses from July to October. If you are doing water quality measurements at the same time, um, 
please do the water quality measurements first and the rake tosses after um, because the rake tosses will disturb the water and can change some of those results. So for example, water clarity or conductivity. Um, when you're doing the rake tosses, uh, do three rake tosses um, in separate locations. Uh, by location, I mean one side of your dock and then maybe changing to the other or walking um, down the shore a little bit. So they don't have to be completely different locations. <clears throat> So essentially what you're going to do is um, hold on to the rake head and the rope, gently toss uh, the rake head into the water off of your dock or boat um, while you're holding on to the rope. And then um, you can slowly feed the rope down until you reach either the end of the rope or the bottom of the water and then um, pull uh, the rope back up. And uh, you may notice that there's some plants on this on the rake and um, just remove any of those plants and place them into the white bucket. Um, while you're doing that, just make sure to wear gloves because um, there's, there could be things like uh, zebra mussels or mystery snails attached to these aquatic plants. And um, for zebra mussels and quagga mussels, they can be quite sharp and they'll cut your hands. Um, and uh, with mystery snails, um, sometimes they carry disease or parasites. So just to for safety reasons, uh, it's, it's best to wear thicker gloves if possible. Once you place the um, plants in the bucket, you can remove them and sort them on a flat surface, um, basically by physical characteristics. So um, I don't expect you to be able to identify the specific species, but if you could sort the plants out kind of in different piles by species, um, and then once you have them there, if possible, um, take photos of them uh, with some sort of object in the photo for size comparison. So this might be a ruler or a coin or really any other object that you have on hand. Um, when you're uh, sorting through the plants, look for invasive species that you're able to identify. Um, and if you're having trouble, um, you can always use resources such as iNaturalist to help you out with, or if you do think that you might see an invasive species but you're not sure what it looks like, you can always get in contact with myself and I can um, help you to identify that species. What we're really looking for is um, that invasive uh, starry stonewort. So um, pay attention specifically for that. And if you do think you see that, um, I, I ask that you collect a sample and I'll go over how to do that um, shortly. Once you have um, looked through the plants and um, uh, collect a sample if necessary, then you can dump the bucket of water and plants back into the lake and um, then start uh, your, your new rake toss. So um, just repeat that two more times for a total of three rake tosses and um, you can use another location on your dock or down the shoreline um, or elsewhere. Um, one thing I do want to point out is um, try to aim um, for areas that are three meters deep or more. Um, so like I said, usually starry stonewort hills are around three meters deep. So um, if you can find areas that have that depth or deeper, that would be ideal for these rake tosses. Um, once you're finished doing your rake tosses, uh, you can record and submit your data, which will be um, uh, the details of that will be provided in the field manual and instructions on how to do that. Unfortunately, I don't have a video um, to explain how to do the rake toss yet, so I had to borrow someone else's. Um, so this will be similar methodology to what you will be doing, um, and it'll give you an idea of what a rake toss looks like. Um, this one was actually from the state, so just uh, be aware that some of the species may actually look different. And again, I don't expect you to identify every single species like she does in the video, um, just to sort the plants based on uh, some of the physical characteristics that you can see. Now that you know how to do the rake tosses, um, if you think that you see starry stonewort, please collect a sample. Um, and, and get in contact with myself or even Asia as soon as possible. Um, we, we would want to uh, take a look at the sample and, and confirm whether that would be starry stonewort. Um, so there's a specific way that we would like you to do that. So if you, if you come across something that you think is starry stonewort, take some close-up photos of it 
um, and then take the um, the uh, algae or plant or whatever it is and put it in a Ziploc bag um, and double that up, add some water to the bag. And then if, if possible, try to include um, the stem, the bulbils, which are those um, white structures that I was talking about that look, resemble stars and nodes with um, those branchlets coming off of them if possible. And then once uh, you've sealed the bag, please refrigerate the sample until um, we can arrange how to pick up or drop it, it off somehow. All right, so some of the other invasive species that I want to point out that you're likely to see um, during your monitoring activities, um, one of them being Eurasian water milfoil, which is a submerged uh, aquatic invasive species. Um, we actually have a YouTube video to help you with identification and, and provide a little bit more information on Eurasian water milfoil. So you can check that out on our YouTube channel. Um, the next common species is uh, Phragmites. Um, so this is a, a wetland plant that we often see um, on shorelines and in ditches or along roads. Um, so this one will appear um, as emerged from the water surface. Uh, the round goby is one that was uh, reported quite a bit last year um, from our volunteers. So that's another um, invasive species to look out for. You also might observe some uh, mystery snails. So there is the Chinese mystery snail, which is that uh, lower photo there. Um, that one's a little bit larger, so it, it grows up to about six and a half centimeters. Or um, there is the banded mystery snail, which is that top picture there. So it's got those kind of distinct bands around its shell and um, it's a little bit smaller, so it'll grow um, up to three and a half centimeters. Um, we're we're in the process of working on videos for these, but those ones uh, should hopefully be up um, soon on our YouTube. So those will be able to help you identify um, the snails as well. And then lastly, um, one that you're probably already familiar with is zebra mussels and um, another spe similar species are coaga mussels. Um, both of these are, are very sharp and um, they can be attached to aquatic plants. So just be cautious when you're handling plants. Um, and uh, we, these zebra mussels are actually on a Eurasian water milfoil plant, so we have two invasive species there. All right, so some last few things that I wanted to point out um, before the end of our session today is that uh, Aisha and I are planning to do a, kind of an informal group check-in where um, you're welcome to ask questions or um, to get help with some of the equipment or to share some interesting information you found. Um, so we do plan to do that at one point in the season and it'll probably be over Zoom. Um, for those of you who are participating in the Invasive Species Spotter Program, I want to uh, schedule kind of an informal one-on-one -on -one check in with you. So that could be either a phone call or virtual call. And um, that's uh, just to kind of check in and see where you're at with that. And if you have any questions or, or maybe there's um, a specific species that you might have seen that you want to share. Um, and then the last kind of thing is, is to take photos of yourself while monitoring. So as Aisha probably already mentioned, um, they, our funders are really looking to see um, these kind of volunteer photos um, of you in action. So they're really interested to see this as well as um, the SSEA board members. They, they love to see um, our volunteers out there having a good time doing some monitoring. So um, you could become famous with this if it goes up on social media. So, uh, so there's also the possibility for that. And lastly, have fun and stay safe while you're doing this. So remember to follow COVID protocols and, and um, some of those safety pointers that Aisha mentioned. But at the end of the day, you're getting outdoors and um, you're getting to be have fun in nature. So enjoy yourself. And thank you everyone. So um, we really wouldn't be able to do this volunteer work without you. And um, we really appreciate your support. Um, specifically for the starry stonewort uh, detection, uh, we were funded um, by the Invasive Species Centre, so they were able to provide us money so that we could purchase some of these equipment. And then some equipment was donated by uh, two different uh, businesses here. So Bin City was one of them, and then the other was um, the Home Hardware in Elmville. So I guess with that, I will um, 
open it up to any questions. So again, feel free to, to throw stuff in the chat uh, if you have questions there or Gail. I was just gonna say, are those double um, sided rates, just the bottoms, are they available at hardware stores? I don't think I've seen one before. They're gonna be custom made. So I'm ordering the equipment and then I'm gonna custom make them. I've seen the double sided rakes on eBay before. And I, to be honest, I'm not sure how expensive they are. Um, but yeah, we're, we're going to custom make them. So essentially it's just taking two rake heads and, and attaching them together and then putting a rope on that. Okay. But it does seem like a waste because we have to waste the handles. I'm, I'm at Bass Lake and while we don't have the uh, grass that you, as far as I know, um, our, our, our topography is slightly different here than you would see along a shoreline in Georgian Bay, I, I, I'm thinking. But we have had uh, massive numbers of the Chinese and banded snails uh, the last mm -hmm. two seasons. I don't remember seeing them before here, uh, like literally uh, bags and bags of them and they smell really bad. Mm -hmm. um, that, it's not so much the smell that turns people off, it's that they are taking over the environment that used to be the domain of the regular snails uh, and clams, I, because I, I believe they're siphon uh, animals, siphoning animals, I, maybe I'm wrong, or mollusks anyway. Yeah. Anyway, um, who, I, I wouldn't mind watching the lake to see the first signs of them uh, this coming season. Is that something anyone would be interested in for research? Yeah, for sure. So I think that's something that you could uh, document those observations kind of along with your shore watch um, work that you're doing. So just kind of putting that in the, the invasive species section of that. And so when you start to see those those snails coming along, then um, yeah, that would be useful for us to know. And we we have sort of like definitely last year was uh, was quite a warm summer. And so um, some of the reading that, that we were doing indicated that water temperature could play a role in you know, in some of those population explosions, I guess. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I just had a question about uh, the st starry storm wart. Is that starry storm wart. Storm wart. Storm wart. Yeah. yeah, where did you guys find it in Honey Harbor? Oh, uh, uh, do you remember Aisha? Um, I don't think I was part of that, all that information pretty that quickly. Question. It probably would have been at one of the marinas. So what tends to happen is, some of the marinas will apply herbicide to get rid of other aquatic plants. And then oh, yeah. because yeah. the starry stonewort is not a plant, it's an algae, um, so it doesn't get killed off by the herbicide. And then because there's all of a sudden no plants anymore, it can just go hog wild. <laughs> so it, it does tend to be a, a bigger issue in some of the marinas. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in, in Honey Harbor, I'm not sure exactly where, where it's popped up. And some of the marinas have it. It's just noted in Honey Harbor Landing. From so. using their uh, slips. The so it's, say back. that again, Keith? In some of the marinas in Severn Sound, the, the uh, cabin cruisers have been stopped and they're getting out of their uh, slips by Starry Stonewall. So it yeah. grows very <laughs> And there is a paper, uh, well, there's, there's some uh, reference to it first being found in Lake Ontario marinas. And so we know that boats travel up and down the system in the Great Lakes. And so it's easy to get um, established in our marinas because somebody will buy a boat from a marina in Lake Ontario and bring it up, put it in the water, and then you have the invasive species uh, growing in our marinas. So that's yeah, we sort of had this direct connection with Lake Ontario that uh, is not entirely natural. <laughs> well, not natural at all. <laughs> the lock system? Yeah, yep. 